For the third year in a row, Israeli police forces have raided the Al-Aqsa Mosque during Ramadan. These are the scenes that have shocked the world. Hassam Zomlot, Palestinian ambassador to the UK, thank you for joining us on Navara Media. Um, I, I want to start by putting to you the, the Israeli explanation of the scenes we have seen in the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The Israeli police have suggested there were masked agitators who barricaded themselves in the mosque. They were throwing stones and fireworks, and the Israeli police only got involved so that they could enable dawn prayer to go ahead. How would you respond to, to that explanation? Uh, it's an explanation we have always heard from the Israeli side, whitewashing their crimes. The uh, evidence is very clear. Uh, everything was taken by videos. The world has seen what happened. Those are worshippers. Ramadan is a very special month of purity, prayer, uh, devotion to God. And for hundreds of thousands of Palestinians, it's the opportunity to actually serve uh, God and their people. And there is the i'tikaf, which happens in mosques all over Palestine and in the Arab and Muslim world, when people spend their evening in mosque until the dawn prayer, particularly in the second half of the holy month of uh, Ramadan. Israel has turned such uh, a commitment to God and religion also an act of oppression by the Israeli authorities uh, uh, and an act of resistance by the Palestinian people. The right to worship is sacred. And we don't even need to discuss very key principles here. The first principle is that, you know, uh, that the sanctuary of uh, holy sites is, is, a, is, is a universal value to respect uh, religious uh, sites, that Al-Aqsa is a mosque. And a mosque is a place of worship for Muslims. That Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, is an occupied city. That Israel, as an occupying power, has the absolute full responsibility to protect and respect the rights of people to worship and uh, the status quo uh, of Jerusalem. But having done all that, it tells you all you need to know about the current situation. This is, this is chronic provocation after provocation. And now with Ben Gvir and Smotrich and on the top of them, Benjamin Netanyahu, they are going into the religious confrontation. Ben Gvir only a couple of days ago called for his followers and the Jewish people to ascend to Al-Aqsa Mosque. We're going into the religious confrontation, way more dangerous than political and legal conflict. And also it's a provocation to export the crisis that they have created in Israel itself uh, among their own people. You know. Um, you see hundreds of thousands of Israeli people in the streets in the last few weeks protesting their own government, the uh, autocracy, the authoritarian uh, uh, regime they are inflicting. And you know, they haven't made any link with the occupied territories, but in fact, the occupied territories, because these, these ministers are settlers, most of them live in illegal settlements. It's the occupied territory and the, the settler movement, the Bengvir and the Smotrich are now turning against their own people. Uh, and therefore, the situation is rather very acute and extremely dangerous. It was the storming of the Al-Aqsa Mosque in 2021 that set off the chain of events that led to a full-scale war, um, essentially. Airstrikes in Gaza killed 256 people, 15 Israelis died. Is there a possibility that this raid today will lead to a similar escalation. We have seen enough violence inflicted both by the Israeli occupying army and the settlers. Settler terrorism in every sense. I'm sure you followed what happened in the occupied West Bank over the last few days and weeks, including the Hawara and the pogrom that happened in Hawara. I'm sure you've seen that the Israeli army has given them complete cover and protection. And the Israeli political class have given them such a, a, a support uh, uh, Bing Veer, one of the senior ministers, uh, and Smotrich comes out in public and says that uh, Hawara uh, should be raised off earth. Later, he tried to retract uh, without really convincing anyone. So now you have uh, the government of Israel, the army of Israel, and the settlers literally wreaking havoc in the occupied West Bank. And your question is the, is the right question. While attention is being put on the brutality of the Israeli occupation against worshippers in Al-Aqsa Mosque last night. And it is brutal, it is barbaric, it is illegal, it's a war crime, and it must stop immediately and accountability 
for what happened for all those involved in such atrocities. But things have been happening on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis. Only for the last three months, 94 Palestinians were killed by the Israeli occupation forces and the settler militias in the occupying uh, uh, territories. 17 of them are children, uh, one woman. Uh, uh, Michael and the four uh, uh, sometimes media focus on big flash points but does not really bring the story to a situation whereby things are boiling things in the occupied territories are at a boiling point right now and what you have seen in Aqsa mosque might be a spark or the you know the tip of the iceberg but things have been brewing for a long long time illegality attacks raids killing at well, Jenin, Nablus, Hebron, the blockade of Gaza, the theft of land, the ethnic cleansing of Masaf Riyatta to the south uh, uh, of Hebron, the house demolition, the arrest at well, the administrative detention, the detention of minors and, and, uh, and uh, children, the list goes on and on and on and on of a regime that is built on the oppression of another of an entire nation, of a regime that is well described by your own civil society and human rights organizations like Amnesty International as full-fledged apartheid that employs segregation and a, race, a system of racial domination and hegemony, uh, employs military occupation, employs colonial settlement, employs blockade like in Gaza to actually uh, proceed in that ethnic cleansing and displacement and rep replacement of Palestine. And therefore, we should not be surprised of what happened last night in Al-Aqsa Mosque. All this is the lack of accountability, the lack of any consequences. Um, uh, let's talk about the current divisions in Israeli civil society. We're seeing huge civil unrest from Jewish Israelis, um, divisions in their politics that we haven't seen for some time. Obviously, that's in the context of a government which is further to the right than any in recent memory, or perhaps any ever. Does that provide opportunities for the Palestinian people, or do you see this as somewhat of a, a sideshow? We were hoping that it would provide an opportunity for peace and for justice and for a final uh, resolution to the, all the issues we have. But all these hundreds of thousands of, of Israelis in the streets make no link whatsoever between the, what is happening to them by their own government, this quest for uh, complete dictatorship uh, in Israel. They make no link of that to the occupied territories, when in fact the link is all over. In fact, it is the occupation that is corrupting Israel. It is all these politicians that come from the occupied territory, Israelis, illegal colonial settlers, that wreak havoc uh, and turn back uh, to their own uh, society. So, so far, Michael, we haven't seen that link being made. Uh, and until the Israelis believe that there will not be democracy in Israel, there will not be a normal state with its borders, there will not be normalcy without ending their illegal occupation of the occupied territories, without ending the practice of apartheid, without ending the blockade on Gaza, and without giving the Palestinian people our right of self-determination and the rights that are enshrined in international law. So while there is what you just described as unprecedented movement in Israel against their own government, it is very unfortunate that no one is making such a strikingly clear link and relationship between what is happening in Israel and the oppression that has lasted for 75 years of the people of Palestine. And I suppose separate from the protests, you know, part of the, the disquiet with the Israeli government from parts of Israeli civil society and also parts of Western civil society is that they've got these unsavory far-right elements as part of the government. Now, is that something that the Palestinian people care about? To, to see people who are more extreme than potentially previous Israeli governments, at least in, in, in words? Let's, let's be clear here. We haven't seen any government in Israel of late, recently, that behaves in a structurally different manner as far as the occupied territories. It's very regrettable that all of them, you, you mentioned the 2021 uh, events, it wasn't this government, it was another government. Last year, it was Yair Lapid, and, uh, and uh, others who were seen by the West to be center and center left, uh, uh, which, which was the highest year where Palestinians were killed by the Israeli army, more than 240, and the atrocities that happened in 2022 are very well recorded. Uh, so the highest by, in, by, in, in what period? In, in, in the highest since 2000, uh, since the year 2000, actually. Mm -hmm. So the UN started recording uh, Palestinian uh, casualties since 2000, the second intifada. And therefore, um, you know, it's very regrettable that this is chronic. 
Chronic because of your previous question. Because for the, for the average mainstream Israeli public, the Palestinian issue has become an issue, an issue. For right, for center, for left, for up, for down, it's an issue. And it is our duty, all of us, to make it the issue. Because you cannot be controlling the lives of more than 7 million people in the occupied territories, in the historic area of Palestine, against our own will, and denying another 7 million the right of return to their homes and properties, and act as if this doesn't exist in a delusional manner. You know, and Netanyahu's biggest success is convincing the Israeli public to a high degree of success, I must say, that the Palestinian issue, abracadabra, has disappeared, doesn't exist. We shouldn't worry about it. We have made peace uh, here and there, and Emirates and Bahrain, and, and we will continue to do so. The last of our worry is those millions of people we oppress, we colonize, and we subjugate for the last so many years. Uh, 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 at one point in time, they may vanish or evaporate in a thin air. That's the Netanyahu logic. And then with the feeding of the relig religious Zionism so hard in the Israeli political decision-making uh, process, uh, you are talking about a situation whereby Israel is shifting into uh, a, a situation of a, 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 an extreme dangerous territory of the war of gods. And this is none of us wants to see. There is one God and God loves all of his children and the, the uh, occasions, the uh, holy occasions of Ramadan, of Passover, of Easter should be occasions for people to come together, not for exclusive claims. Exclusivity in such a, a sacred piece of land, a cherished piece of land, doesn't work. And the current Israeli government is all over exclusivity. In fact, in their contract, the formation of the government, of the coalition, the first sentence is laying exclusive claims of the Jewish people to the land of Israel from the river to the sea. And, there, and, and also promising that the colonial settlements in all this area will be expedited, will be increased, uh, and what have you. And therefore, they just hit you in the face to tell you, if, to tell you that we go against everything I have been working for, and you as an international community and international media. The problem is with the utter silence, the deafening silence of the international community, the inaction. Like today, okay, some British ministers, uh, officials, you know, are shocked. So we are all shocked of the scenes because they know this is unprovoked following your four, first question. It's unprovoked. People were praying in the mosque, inside the mosque. Uh, 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 but sh being shocked, being sad, being concerned is not a legal term. It's an emotional term. term. Where is the condemnation? And then following the condemnation, where is the action? You know, can you imagine if armed soldiers storm a mosque here, the Central Mosque in Regent's Park in London, what happens? Or storms a synagogue, or a church for that matter. What happens? What would be the reaction of the world? If Muslims, if armed Muslim soldiers uh, storm a synagogue or a church, you would have seen uh, a, a, an international roar uh, against such actions because religious places are really, uh, there is such a basic universal principle about the sanctuary, the respect, the bow, for people's belief, uh, let alone when it is such a sensitive place at a sensitive time. So the question is, why Israel is doing this? Because they want to provoke. Why they want to provoke? Because they want to export their crisis, because they live on crises, they live on issues, they live on conflicts, they live on violence. And why are they being able to do so over such a long course of time? because they receive no consequences. The moment we start attaching consequences to people like Ben Gvir, Smotrich, Netanyahu, and all the army officers who pull the trigger with impunity, the moment we stop putting Israel above the law, the moment we stop really enforcing our international rules equally, I mean, it's a, it's a farce. It's a farce. When the people like you watching what the UK and the, and the US and the rest of the West are doing vis-a-vis -vis Russia and Ukraine, and then when it comes to Israel. The West insists to put Israel above every single provision of law, even when Israel turns against their own people in Israel still. You know, London only 10 days ago received the Israeli prime minister, and before him they received the foreign minister, and they signed something called 2030 uh, roadmap between the UK 
and Israel in, in a manner that is, in my opinion, insulting to all that the UK stands for and to all that international law stands for. It was, just, when it was a strange agreement. We talked about it on, on the Barra Media. So it involved saying we as the UK oppose the term apartheid being used in, in Israel. We oppose boycott, divestment and, and sanctions. I want to talk about those issues in a moment. Um, I suppose your role as Palestinian ambassador to the UK, in part, it's to talk about the situation in Palestine to sort of reveal the reality of what is going on. It's also a political leadership role. And I suppose, you know, most of our viewers will, most of our viewers, I think, will recognize that the Palestinian people are being severely oppressed by the Israelis. Is there political leadership you can offer though? Is there a strategy to change the situation? What can you offer to the Palestinian people to say, yes, we do have some route out of this beyond saying how terrible it is? Well, the first and foremost important uh, route for us is our people. And, and you see them everywhere. You saw them in Jerusalem uh, uh, last night. Uh, you, you see them in Janine and in Khalil and Hebron. You see them in Nablus. You see them in Gaza. Uh, you see them uh, uh, everywhere. You see them in refugee camps all over, scattered in neighboring countries. And after uh, almost 105 years, and I mentioned that date because that was the Belfort Declaration, the, the Britain, Great Britain, promising the establishment of, uh, of a na national home for the Jews in Palestine and uh, committing to respect the rights, the religious and civil rights of the minorities. We, the original native of the, of the land for millennia were turned into minorities, have the right only to pray. And, you know, what happened in London only last week was just an extension of that, uh, Michael. If you go back to that agreement with Israel, we are not mentioned in light of political and national rights. We are only mentioned. But I suppose, I suppose in terms of strategy, what I mean is, yes, your, your people is your strength, protests here and there. But you have got a situation where Israel is now normalizing relationships with lots of Arab countries. Mm. The Palestinian people seem divided when it comes to political leadership. Is there any hope? Do you have hope that sort of the situation might improve in the coming years? And, and how would that happen? We do have hope. The, the Palestinian uh, leadership and the uh, Palestinian national institutions uh, have a very clear political program that is in line with international resolutions and international law. The first is the struggle to end Israel's occupation that began in 1967. The wider community, international community, called that the two-state solution. People confuse that. They think the two-state solution is a Palestinian demand. No, it's not. The two-state solution was a Palestinian concession to the international community. In the 80s, we have taken a decision to actually announce a state of Palestine in the West Bank and Gaza with East Jerusalem as its capital uh, in a way to ally ourselves during Yasser Arafat time, the founder of our movement, of our movement, movement and the father of our nation, uh, to actually ally ourselves with international law, thinking strategically that the international community will deliver uh, that program that, with us, together with our people and struggle, and it was the first intifada um, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, the first main point is to end the occupation and to fulfill the right of self-determination for the Palestinian people. In you see what I mean? This is, a, this is an aim and an objective, and I suppose, is what would be the route to achieving, what, what pressure can Israel be put under? Because at the moment, they do seem like they can basically get away with anything. Yes, I mean, right. are there new alliances that you could form? What's the situation with China, say? Is there, is there some sort of route in the future that people can say, oh, there is some possible hope that the Palestinians will achieve liberation. We have very good, good relations with China. We have good relations with everybody. Uh, and we are building many alliances, but we are relying more on the people rather than the governments, including here in the UK. And we are investing so heavily in creating a public opinion and a grassroots and a base that does exactly what they did for South Africa and towards the South African struggle, the anti-apartheid movement. And by the way, Michael, you may remember that it emanated from London. This was the, the capital, the headquarters of the anti-apartheid movement. And I, everywhere I go in the UK, I see the beginning of that movement vis-a-vis -vis Palestine. Governments have their calculations. And this is our main investment in the, in the people of the world, in the people of the UK and everywhere. And I tell you, in there, all opinion polls suggest, including in America only very recently, if you follow all the opinion polls there, the, there is a conversion in the public opinion towards the rights of the Palestinians in the US, in Europe, and everywhere else. 
uh, now we have a strategy, and our strategy is to create consequences for the state of Israel. These consequences we've decided, as in the leadership, to be peaceful and legal. That's why we decided to join the United Nations, and we got a state status in the UN. And then from there, we went to the International Criminal Court. The whole idea is to actually bring those who have perpetuated crimes against our people to justice. In this incident, it has to be international justice because Israel and the Israeli court is completely Im implicit and complicit in the occupation and the atrocities. Uh, we also have just asked at the end of last year for an advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice. Every year we table many resolutions designed for accountability in the United Nations Human Rights Council, including last week. The, the majority of the world vote for us in all these resolutions, but guess key countries like the US or the UK. The UK voted against our main resolutions last week in the UN Human Rights Council and abstained on other under the pretext that all these resolutions single Israel out, as if the issue is with the mechanism, not with the heart of the law and the commitment of the, of the UK towards international law. So there is a strategy in the international sense to bring about accountability, to attach course to all these illegalities, to leverage our status in, in the international system, to actually get the, all these courts and get all these mechanisms, something similar to what happened in South Africa. But some governments are so resisting our attempts, including the UK government, the ICJ, they just threatened that it's inappropriate. The ICC, former Prime Minister Boris Johnson wrote a public letter he, that was published that he opposes the Palestinian people and leadership to go and take Israel to the ICC. And guess why he said in that letter they oppose? Because Israel is a friend and an ally. You know the meaning of that. The meaning of that, Michael, is that international law only applies to foes and enemies. It does not apply to friends. So this is why you have many of us all over the world to engage the people, the civil society, then create a movement. And I am certain, absolutely certain, that this is what we're going to do in the future. This is the best investment, the most sustainable, the most assuring. In South Africa, during the apartheid regime, the governments were lagging behind. It was too late in the game when the Thatcher government and the Reagan administration came. It was the people. So, yes, if you ask me, uh, have faith in the people everywhere. And I suppose, again, in that role of political leadership, does it also involve a position on what people shouldn't be doing? And I suppose here there is talk of a third intifada. Of course, especially the second intifada was, was fairly violent. Would the PLO's position be to say to people, no, keep this peaceful? Or do you celebrate a diversity of tactics when it comes to... To resistance in Palestine? What's the what's yeah, the position? There? We have been peaceful all along since the beginning of this. And every act the Palestinians have taken over the years is an act of self-defense. And uh, now our, our overall strategy, and you know, in the West, there is a lot of media focus on the react rather than the act. This has been happening over tens of years. So uh, the, the reaction would be what Palestinians did, uh, <laughs> you know, omitting uh, the real act that has led us where uh, where we are. But the PLO position is very clear. Uh, we are engaged uh, internally on the ground with what we call popular resistance. Popular resistance is our ability to protect ourselves, our properties, our lands, our sacred places. Popular resistance is the demonstrations that happen on a daily and weekly basis. This is by, any, by any means necessary. Yeah, uh, uh, demonstrations. We, 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 we are occupied. We are not armed by and large. Uh, we are facing one of the strongest armies on earth, a nuclear power, and therefore it is the moral high ground and our numbers and masses and our persistence and perseverance is what matters the most for us. And uh, we realize that engaging Israel in, the, in that arena is going to be advantageous to them given the, the sheer power and the, the, the lack of accountability in the international arena so far. So uh, the popular resistance is mass movement like the first intifada, and it's happening, and it's taking shape and expanding. And Jerusalem is one of the forms. When people go in their tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, to pray, it's a form of resistance also. Uh, but also, we want to see uh, a parallel track in the international arena to finally uh, make sure that illegalities are marked.
that anybody who commits crimes in Palestine would not be able to take a flight, that settlers will be banned from arriving to the UK and other main, main countries in the future, that the settlement products are being banned every, uh, everywhere, that the feasibility of the illegality, the economic feasibility is being undermined. And this process is slow, it's slow because of the calculation of politician. The, 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 what, how can I describe it for you? There is, there, there, there is cowardice when it comes to main international issues, unfortunately. Politicians calculate. But the trajectory of things are definitely going in that direction. And there is no other strategy that we can, we can see appropriate at this point in time other than the mass movement in Palestine coupled with a mass movement outside, covered by international law and international mechanisms that bring all the situation to some sort of accountability and some sort of a change of the cost benefit and power relations. And can we talk about the UK specifically? I mean, you've expressed some optimism there. You think things are going in the right direction. I mean, if you look the at- The people. If you, so the people, not necessarily the governments. I mean, here though, we did have a Labour Party which was led by someone who had been part of the pro-Palestine movement. Um, he failed. I mean, people have the different analyses of, of why um, that was. Now in charge of the Labour Party is Keir Starmer. Now we've gone from someone who was a pretty uncompromising ally of the Palestinian people to someone who is now saying that it would be wrong and inappropriate to call Israel apartheid. We have MPs who have to stand up in Parliament and apologise for calling Israel apartheid because otherwise they're threatened with losing the whip. Keir Starmer has also said he's opposed to, to boycott, divest and, and sanction. So one strategy for holding Israel to account. I mean, are, are you disappointed at the trajectory of the UK Labour Party? Let me talk first about the Labour Party before I, I talk about the leader of the party. And, um, you know, over the years, um, the Labour Party has a very strong base and its base tilts always towards fairness, justice, international law. That's absolute. And you will find the base of Labour, the, the, the constituents of Labour, uh, the CLPs of Labour, the, the trade unions of Labour, the Labour movement always, always siding with uh, fair play, with equal application of international law, with our universal values that you make no mistake about. And having said that, Palestine has such support among the Labour, the heart of the Labour uh, movement. Sir Keir Starmer knows this, every Labour leader knows this. It was Ed Miliband that introduced the immediate recognition of the State of Palestine. And it was actually during Keir Starmer that the, the base has pushed for a ban of the settlement product and the deliberations of the conferences. So the, the commitment of the various leaderships and the base and the successive conferences or the annual conferences of the party have brought the party into a policy vis-a-vis -vis Palestine that is balanced, that respects international law, that wants and seeks to recognize the state of Palestine immediately. And immediate here is more relevant than the recognition, because if you don't do it in the first day, you wouldn't do it. Uh, uh, and the banning of settlement products, the marking of all illegalities, helping us in the international uh, arena, especially the ICC and the ICJ, unlike the current situation with the government, where they are blocking us. Uh, uh, now, the real test is coming. Uh, uh, in the coming few days and weeks as the uh, Labour manifesto is being drafted and I am scheduled to meet the leader of the Labour Party in the coming couple of weeks. So please ask me that question after I have met Sir Keir Starmer soon. So should I take it that at the moment you are remaining open-minded despite the, the noises which have been made about, for example, apartheid and, and BDS? I mean, I, I presume you, you, you wholeheartedly disagree with Keir Starmer suggesting it would be wrong to call Israel apartheid. I think uh, Keir Starmer, as a as a as a, uh, a lawyer of international law and uh, somebody who spent much of his life in the, understands that uh, law cannot be subdivided. You cannot pick and choose. It's not cherry picking here. And I, I very much hope we will all arise uh, to the moment of really, really being principled, ethical, and. Uh, uh, seeing Palestine not only as Palestine, but as a litmus test of who we are all together. And I hope none of us will fail the very values of the people, including the British, uh, the British public and the Labour voters. And I hope the Labour leadership uh, would not just want to focus on one-sided conversation. They would open up and see millions of people in the UK, millions upon millions, uh, see things for what they are. They see the truth. Thanks to you, by the way, Michael. Thanks to people like you, many platforms like you, 
we are no longer at the time when only a couple of platforms decide what we know and how we know them and when we know them. Now we have many influencers like you who are feeding the people the reality and the truth. And therefore, uh, I think as much as we are challenged, every politician is challenged to really side with the truth, side with the justice, side with international law. Britain uh, uh, is renowned for the rule of law. That's, that's the, the heart of this country, the rule of law. Can you imagine if the rule of, of law was not applied equally on everybody, if it, it applied according to your height or width or color or creed or race, it would be disastrous. So we are really hoping that the labor leadership is going to live up to the expectations of its own base and the expectation of many, even beyond this country. Hassam Zomba, thank you so much for speaking to us at Navarra Media.